From there, uh, let's get started with Matt Gresh from Iowa Department of Natural Resources talking about Iowa. We're going to jump across the river. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the geology of Iowa cold water streams and uh, with particular reference to why we have cold water resources at all in the state of Iowa, because we're not uh, obviously at high latitude or at high elevation. Um, so I put together this presentation last year and I, and I modified it a little and I thought uh, people might might be interested in, in the geology of Iowa and why our particularly interesting sequence of events leads to, to cold water streams. The presence of our, these cold water resources in the Iowa Driftless um, is genuinely uh, what I would call a fortuitous convergence of geologic events that are spread across hundreds of millions of years. So I would say there are four main things to keep in mind. The sort of alternating occurrence of uh, carbonate, carbonate being limestone or dolostone, and shale bedrock. Uh, a particular structural orientation of our bedrock strata that is slightly different in Iowa than what you might see in Wisconsin or, or Minnesota, and uh, erosion and exposure on a time scale that other landscapes in Iowa simply haven't experienced, and then uh, a lack of meaningful glacial deposits. So just a little bit of short background on um, the geology of Iowa as it pertains to what, what we're interested in here. So with only one tiny exception, the rocks, the upper most exposed bedrocks of Iowa are, are entirely sedimentary rocks, which is a little bit different than what you folks in Wisconsin or Minnesota uh, are used to seeing. So we basically have sandstone, limestone, dolostone, and shale, and that's that's pretty much what we've got with, with very few exceptions. So here's a bedrock geologic map of the state of Iowa. Um, and you can see I, I would I would try to convince you that these rocks are exposed from the northeast corner to the southwest corner uh, in in a series of parallel bands, uh, with the exception of the Cretaceous rock, which which doesn't follow that trend. So imagine taking state of Iowa and and cutting it along that red line there uh, and looking inside it as if you were cutting a cake and looking inside. So here's here's what you would see. You would see all of these uh, what what I would what I refer to as as Paleozoic rocks. So Cambrian through Pennsylvanian, being uh, oriented um, parallel, but in a, at a at a slight angle from the north uh, east to the southwest, and the uh, the dip of that angle across the state averages about 15 feet per mile. So uh, those rocks are, you know, if you look at a particular rock in one spot uh, and it's at the ground surface, if you were at the same elevation 10 miles west, that rock would be about 150 feet deep. So it's, it's hard to perceive when looking at an outcrop because the dip angle is pretty shallow, but it's, it's consistent across our Paleozoic rocks and it, and it is an important part of our story. And you can see there in the Driftless, uh, the only rocks that are really exposed well in the Iowa Driftless are the Cambrian Ordovician and Silurian rocks. There, there are a few minor Devonian rocks, but, but pretty minor. So after the Paleozoic period, so the Paleozoic, like I said, covers um, in Iowa, the Pennsylvanian through the Cambrian um, in that little sort of red bracket there. Uh, after the Paleozoic period, our rocks were laid down horizontal, so for all intents and purposes, completely flat. And that, that stack of rocks uh, was around 1,000 to 4,000 feet thick, depending on where you are in Iowa. Right, so now the exciting stuff. <laughs> at, the, at the end of the Paleozoic, uh, a major event, a global event occurred called the Assembly of Pangaea, where the North American continent and the Eurasian continent collided to form what uh, what we know now is the Appalachian Mountains, but uh, places like Iowa and Wisconsin and Minnesota were too far inland from that collision to receive any real serious mountain building events. But what we did receive was an, an awful lot of stress on our, our crust, and it, it caused the rocks in Iowa to tip 
from east to west and and that was that's preserved to the current day so most of our structural geologic elements whether they be uh, large faults or or bedrock that isn't flat was created during this uh, major event during the Pennsylvanian. And then after that event, uh, the Midwest went through a very long period of, of minor or no rock deposition. So we had something like 100 million years where the primary uh, occurrence was erosion rather than deposition of rock. So uh, if you look back here, you can see those rocks being tipped, uh, 100 million years of erosion. Imagine taking a knife and slicing it off flat again. You end up with these bands of rock exposed on the surface of uh, increasing age from uh, west to east. And so here you can see the map of Iowa again with these, these alternating bands of rock of different ages um, exposed on the modern land surface in this manner since our in Iowa our modern land surface is relatively flat without a lot of relief. So uh, if if this is the geologic map or the, the bedrock map of Iowa, this would be the surficial landform region map of Iowa. And I think uh, probably not worth getting deep into this today, but here's the take home message for you. Uh, inside the red line there, we have significant glacial deposits. So uh, inside that red line, our bedrock is very poorly to not exposed at all because we have um, anywhere from 50 to 400 feet of glacial deposits inside that red area. And then inside the blue area up there, of course, we have uh, insignificant glacial deposits in the driftless. In the Iowa driftless, we're probably not looking at zero glacial deposits like some of the places in Wisconsin, but they're so insignificant as to be essentially zero. For the, for the purpose of landscape evolution and what it means to the Iowa driftless, it's essentially zero glacial deposits inside that corner. All right, so perennial cold water spring creeks in Iowa. Um, I always looked at the, the published, the DNR published trout map of the state of Iowa, and it was pretty clear that our, our high quality trout habitat uh, was not consistent across the driftless region in Iowa, that there were, there were clearly regions that had a higher density of spring creeks than others, um, and for for years I kind of I kind of had that rattling around in my head, and I started thinking about why is there some geologic control over this, and it turns out there is. So uh, just a little background, so we're all on the same page. Um, we have a series of aquifers and aquitards. So aquifers simply, for our purposes, all we really need to think of is a rock that has good permeability and good porosity, meaning it, it can hold a lot of water and it can also convey that water easily. And then an aquitard simply is a rock layer that does not convey water easily. Um, and there's typically many orders of magnitude difference in how well these two rock layers convey water. So, um, you know, tens of thousands to millions of times quicker conveyance of water in an aquifer than an aquitard. And in the driftless of Iowa, these aquifers are uh, generally carbonate rock, meaning either limestone or dolostone, mostly dolostone. And then the confining layers are typically uh, shales or uh, shaley limestones that are that have enough uh, mud content to prevent to prevent easy groundwater flow. So the picture there is an example of one of these aquitards. That's the Platteville, which is uh, a fairly regional aquitard throughout the driftless. And here's a good example of the surface expression of these different units. So that upper rock, the, the sort of overhang uh, above us there, is um, one of these unconfined aquifers made up of a, a permeable dolostone. And that uh, that sort of little overhang there where where uh, my kids are standing is uh, one of these shale units. So the important thing to think about in terms of the Iowa driftless and our cold water streams is 
um, ab above our heads there that water is is unconfined. So whether it's rain or snow isn't really important. Uh, when it enters that aquifer, it's going to uh, move generally downward in a, in a vertical direction um, under the influence of gravity, um, following whatever preferential or, or you know, poor channels it might be able to find. Um, and then it's, so it's largely moving vertical. And then when it runs into one of these shale layers, the vertical movement is now significantly inhibited. So what ends up happening is the water now moves generally horizontally uh, until it, it daylights, right? So we'll move horizontally along this interface until it finds a valley or a hill slope or something like that, at which point it, it exits uh, as a spring. So this exposed bedrock in Iowa is, is profoundly influenced by, by karst. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know what karst is, but um, just a little background. So um, karst is simply dissolution of rock, and in our case, carbonate rock, by rainwater. And, and our, um, our, our carbonate bedrock is, is mostly calcium carbonate. Um, the dolomite has some, some magnesium in it, calcium magnesium carbonate. Uh, rainwater combines with uh, CO2 to form carbonic acid, which is a weak acid. And over time, this, this weak acid attacks the carbonate bedrock and, and literally dissolves it, um, and, and away it goes. And you can actually sort of um, calculate the, the rate at which this dissolution uh, happens. And over the, you know, averaged over, a, say, a watershed, you can calculate the number of tons per year of, of rock that's removed by, by dissolution. So as you can see in that, that outcrop there to the right, um, this, this long exposed dolostone has been attacked by, uh, by this carbonic acid. And, and all of these empty features now would be filled with water where that rock underground. So you can kind of get a sense of, of how much water can be stored. Uh, here's a great example. That rock is is probably 30 or 40 percent open space now by by simple dissolution over long exposure. So you can imagine when you're thinking about a, a region or a, or a watershed, how much water could be stored in this rock. It's it's you know a very large number. And the important thing is that all of these these pore spaces that have been uh, dissolved in this rock are interconnected by little channels uh, and then also interconnected by that, say, that large crack there in the middle. And these um, sort of preferential pathways like that large crack, um, however the crack may have initiated, become uh, very important to how this, this landscape evolves. Here's another example uh, from Iowa of uh, a bedrock that's been that's now dry because it's exposed. But when it was underground, you can you can see how much water that rock could have held. So here's a little cartoon that I put together showing um, the processes of what's going on um, as as a cross section. So one of those cracks, like you saw in that that last picture there, uh, rainwater or snowmelt uh, exploits that crack, begins to dissolve the rock. Um, we have formation of karst, uh, a sinkhole develops, and it's sort of a positive feedback system. So um, the larger the sinkhole gets, the more rain gets in, and the more rain or snow melt that gets in, the, the more rapid karstification or dissolution occurs. So um, the system sort of feeds on itself, and, and the, the longer it persists, the more, uh, the more water can be conveyed. And then you can see there the rain or snow melt has has you know exploited the sinkhole, uh, traveled down into a cave system that was dissolved by karst, and then once it runs into an impermeable rock layer that it can no longer dissolve, or a rock layer that doesn't transmit water well, or a rock layer that has no significant fracture network, uh, then that water will will travel horizontally until it daylights at a spring, and and for our purposes, um, the important part is that that bedrock that's say deeper than five or six feet uh, all has a uniform temperature year round. And in Iowa, that temperature is typically 45 to 50 degrees. Um, 
for bedrock that's below the frost zone. So uh, as the water travels through that developing cave system, it's going to assume that 45 to 50 degree temperature of the bedrock. And when it exits at a spring, uh, it's, it's traveling with that 45 to 50 degree temperature, no matter what time of the year it is, whether that's June or whether that's January. So here's a, this is my favorite example of, of this system in action. So the upper graph there is the daytime temperature at Elkader, Iowa, which is one of our trout hatcheries and uh, um, typical driftless city for us. So you can see the, the highest daytime temperature in Elkader for the year um, was near 100 degrees in August. The lowest nighttime temperature for the year air temperature was around minus 30 in December and January. So we've got uh, at least 130 degrees of airtime temperature variance at El Cater. Um, and then the large spring that feeds the trout hatchery, the temperature of that water is uh, down below. And other than a couple of blips in February when we may have had some issue with the sensor, um, that temperature is between um, you know, like 46 and 49 degrees the entire year. So there really isn't uh, any significant variation in the water temperature of that spring, despite well over 100 degrees of air temperature variance at Elkader. So now we're gonna look a little bit at these, these karst features and where they occur on the landscape and how that might influence our, our cold water fisheries. Um, this is a map of surface karst features, so, so sinkholes generally is the best way to think of that, as mapped by us at DNR and also by the Iowa Geological Survey. And you can see already that these are occurring in, in sort of uh, distinct bands, uh, as you might imagine. So we have two main types of karst in the Iowa Driftless. Um, there's a simpler variety called dissolution karst that's uh, simply where rainwater has dissolved carbonate bedrock, causing a preferential pathway that's exposed at, at the surface. So we tend to see these as isolated conical features, which uh, usually indicate the collapse of a cave roof, um, and they end up sort of looking like an inverted cone uh, at the surface. And then we have also have a significant amount of what, what are referred to as mechanical karst, meaning uh, as opposed to a collapsed cave roof causing a cone, this is more of uh, a mechanical crack in the upper bedrock that allowed water to flow uh, more readily uh, because of the crack. So these could either be cracks caused by uh, landscape formation. Or we have a lot of situations where uh, this upper dolostone bedrock is very brittle and it rests upon a shale that's readily deformable. And when we have a very steep valley wall, these large blocks of dolostone tend to uh, sort of slide downhill very slowly on that shale, creating a crack because they're brittle. Uh, and then there's also regional jointing that we see in all across the driftless, especially in the Ordovician dolostone, where as a result of uh, unloading from previous burial, that, that rock tends to, to crack as it's exposed uh, at the surface. And those regional mechanical joints are, are um, generally followed the same pattern all, all around the region. So you can see here, here's a picture of um, a sinkhole that uh, I've taken people to uh, on a on field trip. Uh, the picture on the left kind of gives you a scale of that, that sinkhole feature. It's um, I would say it's around 50 meters across and probably um, eight to 10 meters deep. And then at the bottom there on the right, you can see there's there's literally just a hole. And that hole is, in this case, over 300 feet vertical shaft down to the cave system. So they're, they're quite dramatic features and, and somewhat dangerous. And then here's a good example of one of these mechanical joints. Uh, this one's exposed, so there's cold air coming out rather than water, but um, it kind of gives you a, an idea of what, what they look like. And this is an example of this uh, brittle rock being exposed on a steep valley wall and um, sort of expansion or downhill, uh, just gravity causes cracking of the rock. 
So now some examples that you can see on LIDAR. I really, really like LIDAR for this. Um, we've, we've learned more about our karst system in the last few years with really good LIDAR than you could pretty much do any other way. So here's a good example of, um, of dissolution karst features um, on Elk Creek in Clayton County. You can see it's just a, a series of, uh, of sort of conical depressions there. And as you might imagine, right down below them on the edge of that valley wall, there's there are a series of springs that, um, that empty into Elk Creek. Here's another good example on the, the Yellow River uplands in Alamakee County. And you can actually sort of get a, a, a vision pretty easily in your head there of what this karsts or cave system looks like underground by, by looking at the surface expressions of the collapsed cave roofs. And then here's a great example of mechanical karst uh, along Honey Creek and Clayton County. Um, you can see that these features are linear uh, and I uh, hope to convince you there, that's a regional jointing pattern that we see all over the area uh, from, from unloading uh, of bedrock. And then here's another one of these uh, mechanical karst features, which tend to be parallel to the valley walls uh, on Cox Creek in, in Clayton County. And these are all features, keep in mind, where, where rain and snow are entering these cave systems. So here's a great example of one of these um, mechanical karst features near Decora. And you can see that this particular one has um, 46 degree water coming out several hundred gallons per minute all year. And if you sort of walk up and look in, um, you can you can hear the entire system. It sounds like a river running underground. Quite a quite a dramatic thing. So here's a a stratigraphic column of the important parts of the Iowa Driftless. Um, this is simply a, a geologist's way of of visualizing the relative positions of all of the different rock units. Um, the Mississippi River there, you can see at the bottom, um, and then the Mississippi Valley being filled up with sands and gravels. Uh, in Iowa, the Cambrian is exposed right about the level of the Mississippi River. Um, so it doesn't, the Cambrian doesn't figure heavily on our story in Iowa. Our trout streams are primarily situated in those two red brackets I put there. And the repeating pattern is that we have this lower Silurian Dola stone, which is extremely porous from, from karst, uh, sitting on top of a very thick shale of the upper Ordovician called the Makokita shale. And then the second bracket of similar situation with older rock, we have the lower Galena group Dola stone, which is a very brittle, very porous, heavily karsted Dola stone. And it's sitting directly on top of the Platteville which is um, not quite as good of an aquitard as the Makokita, but uh, relatively speaking to the Galena group is an impedance to, to water flow. So we have the same situation in those, those two different units where we have um, a rock that is brittle and porous and conveys water really well sitting on top of a rock that is uh, not porous and does not convey water well. So here's a map now of exposed bedrock in the driftless in, in yellow, and then that same sinkhole map overlaid on top of it. So you can see these sinkholes, um, especially in the, uh, the eastern half of this map. We, we have some trout streams in, in those, that area on the western half, but quite minor compared to the eastern half there. And I'm really going to concentrate on those sort of six or seven counties uh, in the eastern part of this map, because that's more than 90% of our, our cold water resources. So here are what, what I would consider the Silurian escarpment streams. And the Silurian escarpment uh, simply refers to uh, the edge of the Silurian bedrock uh, in Iowa. Uh, basically, to the southwest of that line of red dots there, we have significant Silurian bedrock. Um, 
and to the northeast of that line, it's 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 either eroded entirely or was never present. And there's a quite a sharp boundary there, which shows up well in Iowa, shows up well across the state line or across the river in Wisconsin, uh, and also shows up well in other places in in New York State, for example. The same the same situation shows up well. So uh, this is a major, inside that blue oval there are, are a major portion of our Iowa trout streams. And they result, result from this situation where that Silurian dolostone, which is heavily karsted and permeable, is sitting on top of that Makokata shale. And, and the situation that often arises uh, in our landscape is that uh, the shale forms the bottom of the valleys and the dolostone forms the cliffs and the ridges. And so we end up with rainwater or snowmelt entering that Silurian rock and percolating down um, generally through cave systems until it reaches that shale and at which point it moves horizontally and daylights at a valley wall somewhere as a spring. So um, in Iowa, these streams are generally located in, in Fayette, Clayton, Delaware, and Dubuque counties. So many Iowa uh, trout fishermen would call this sort of the southern tier is is commonly what people would would say and then here's our what we would consider our northern tier of streams so these are galena group platteville contact streams um, our two northeast most counties winnesheek and alamakee and you can see these trout streams generally occur in in that blue oval there so Different rocks, older rocks, but the same geologic situation where rainwater or snowmelt is entering the Galena Group rock, which has been heavily modified by karst, and filtering down through cave systems until it reaches the Platteville Formation, which are uh, significantly less permeable. Not, I wouldn't say um, uh, as impermeable as the Makokita, but but much less permeable. That's the key. And same situation, the Platteville tends to form valleys um, because it's easily erodible. The Galena tends to form ridges and cliffs because it's not as, as easily erodible. And so the, the water ends up daylighting at that contact as a cold water spring. So most of our streams in, in Alamakee and Winnesheek, which are really generally thought of as the best quality streams we have uh, are formed in this manner. So a, a situation that uh, that I like to to ponder is is long term landscape evolution, especially in in areas like this. And when you think about it as a as a geomorphologist, which is what I do, we we see these really large valleys occupied by very small streams, and um, the usual kind of geology one hundred way they might have taught you about streams doesn't really account for this situation. Most of these streams are, are far too small to have eroded the size of the valleys they, they occupy in our driftless. Um, in other parts of Iowa, we see this situation on, on former glacial outwash streams, and, and that's a pretty well understood phenomenon. But um, the situation in the driftless is different because we simply didn't have the um, enormous volumes of, of glacial melt to, to create these large valleys. So I um, started looking into to, to why we see this situation so prevalently. And, and what it comes down to is, um, if you look at these LIDAR maps, you can see that uh, there is continuous headward advancement of these caves. So um, sinkhole forms, creates cave, cave gets larger and larger and larger until at some point it can no longer support the weight of its own roof and it collapses. And so there's this continual situation of enlargement of caves and then collapse and then continued dissolution of all of that collapsed rock as, as water flows through it readily. So you can imagine, you can see here on, on Big Paint Creek how this uh, these streams will continually move up gradient into these cave systems and then eventually new cave systems will form um, at slightly higher elevation from from where those current sinkholes are that will become the new creek valley uh, in the future 
And, and I like to think of this system of uh, continual headward um, collapse uh, as creating collapsed cave valleys. So rather than the, the, the stream actually cutting the valley through physical erosion, um, the stream is simply occupying what used to be a very large cave system and has now been uh, unroofed by collapse and, and dissolution of that rock. So here's a great example. Um, this is Village Creek, but um, Village Creek, Trout Run Creek, and, and Big Paint are three of the best known streams in Iowa that occupy these large collapsed cave valleys where um, this view, I'm standing sort of right behind me is a, a vertical cliff of rock. So you can imagine from where I am looking over towards that other ridge across the way, um, that whole space was occupied by uh, Galena Group Dolomite at, at one point uh, in the not geologically terribly distant past, um, but a large cave system formed, um, matured, collapsed, and, and the rock has been removed by dissolution. So um, you, can, you can just sort of get a sense of the, the volume of rock that has been removed over millions of years of the, the propagation of these, this karst uh, and cave system. So this leads us to what has become a little bit of a, um, a trouble for us at Iowa DNR in, in the, the, our driftless um, recently in terms of our hatcheries, um, this karst system and the, and the caves and then the, the way it evolves and collapses and moves on to a new drainage pattern, it's a constantly changing system. Um, we, we as humans like to think of these things as being pretty uh, stable long-term, but these karst systems are, are fairly dynamic. And, and the trouble it leads to is that when there's a change, that change doesn't typically happen slowly um, over decades or, or millennia. That change often happens almost overnight when one of these, these cave systems goes through a major change. So we see things like um, uh, quantized change in sediment load or stream flow or temperature um, abruptly. And so it sort of occasionally leaves us in the situation of wow, this water quality has changed quickly, uh, what happened? Um, so it's interesting to me in a scientific manner, but but less interesting to the hatchery managers to kind of keep a uh, monitor on, on what's going on with, with these large spring systems. So uh, just to wrap it up, um, I would like to, to uh, reiterate that, that our driftless resources, cold water resources in Iowa are uh, a little different than, than many of them that you're going to see in Wisconsin, um, probably more similar to the Minnesota ones. Uh, but, but really there's four major things to think about in, the, in their simple existence. And if, if any one of these things had not taken place, our, our resources would, would be either a fraction of what they are or non-existent. And that's the the Paleozoic limestone and dolostone aquifers with regularly spaced impermeable layers um, over a period of more than 100 million years. Um, all of these rock strata being tilted by, by a global tectonic event around 300 million years ago, were these rocks not tilted uh, at least a little bit, then we wouldn't have the regular repeated exposure of the different uh, contacts that we need to create significant springs. Um, a significant period of erosion during the Mesozoic and Cenozoic, which allowed multiple episodes of significant karst formation. Um, so we have a, a huge cave network that's well connected. Um, and then a near complete lack of Pleistocene sediment from, from glaciation. I suspect there would be other areas of Iowa that would have these same cold water resources were it not for um, a significant amount of Pleistocene sediment elsewhere, but our driftless was was spared from that. So it's kind of interesting to think about this series of, of totally unrelated events um, coalescing to form the resources that we have uh, in the Iowa driftless. 
Well, thanks so much, Matt. That was fascinating. <laughs> I learned a few new things about geology that I was not familiar with. I bet a lot of our other listeners did too.